Well, look, let's uh, let's start. Let's intro. Let's get Will up on stage. He's going to tell us about building a more friendly Lightning user experience. Welcome, Will. Thanks, guys. Hey, y'all. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm still like my brain is still swelling from this morning. We had some pretty uh, pretty awesome presentations, very technical. So I'm I'm going to take things down a notch. I'm going to um, talk about some of the fuzzier sides of Lightning. Uh, and talk about the user experience of, of what it's like for someone coming on using Lightning and, and maybe how we can improve their experience. Um, so before talking about user experience with Lightning, I just I always want to look back and pay homage to the all-father of wallets, the Bitcoin QT interface. Uh, we've come a long way, um, especially over the last year and a half. I mean, I think when I first started working on Joule, it was pretty much only the Zap desktop app at that point. Um, but over the last year and a half, we've just seen so many new people enter the space, and, and they're doing like a great job. I feel like Lightning has moved so much faster than, than any, uh, any other Bitcoin developments uh, out there. And we've really produced some like fantastic looking applications that really harness the simplicity of what Lightning is supposed to be. You have one balance, you send payments, you receive payments, that's pretty much it, right? Um, but even though these applications really look beautiful and, and you know, have that simplicity first and foremost, uh, the user interface is not the actual user experience. Even though we have these really, you know, svelte, sleek uh, interfaces, um, that won't cover up a bad user experience. So, you know, it's important to remember that as good as something looks, when a user hits a roadblock, when they're having a bad time, uh, it, it just tears the whole thing down. So let's break down uh, what it looks like setting up uh, your, your Lightning wallet and, and what that experience is for you. So you start with just the typical onboarding. And uh, a user flow probably looks something like this. It may be in different orders. Maybe you skip a step. Um, but typically, a user is going to record the seed phrase that powers their node. Um, they're going to have to sync that Lightning node. Hopefully, it's 15 minutes if you're using something like Neutrino. If you're starting from scratch, you're looking at a few hours, uh, quite a few hours. Uh, you're going to have to send an on-chain transaction to a Bitcoin address that um, your Lightning wallet controls. And then with that on-chain fund, you can open your first channel. So overall, this experience can take upwards of hours, um, which is not great. People come to Lightning expecting speed. And oftentimes, you just end up waiting around. So I, one, of, one of my biggest issues when setting up a new uh, Lightning wallet is I often hit this screen where I'm syncing. And while I'm syncing, I could be sending that initial funding transaction. We've already generated the seed. You know the address that I should send to. Let's get that started right away. That's the slowest part. I could be backing up that seed phrase or setting up uh, a whole backup process for not just the phrase, but uh, static channel backups or you know, something to make sure that uh, I can recover my node while it's setting up. Um, and I could just be learning more about Lightning in general. You know, anytime you're showing a user a big progress bar, uh, that's an opportunity where you can start to set expectations because we all take for granted how much we know about Lightning coming into it. But a lot of people um, don't necessarily understand what's coming next, what, how channels work, all that stuff. Um, so if we can parallelize this experience, if we can get the user doing all this at once, we really cut down uh, the amount of time they're going to spend before they can actually start using their wallet. Um, so once a user has synced their node, uh, the first thing that they have to do is set up a channel. Your node isn't really a node until you have a channel. You're not on the graph. You're just kind of floating out in space. So you need to make that first connection. Um, but that's really hard for people who are new to Lightning. They don't know how to assess what makes a good channel. You know, They don't know about liquidity and, and peers and, and, and all that. Um, and if you're totally new to Lightning, you just came and you downloaded an application, maybe you didn't onboard with an application that you wanted to use, so you don't even know what channel you should connect to. You know, if you're coming from BitRefill or from Yalls, you probably want to connect to their node first because that's what you're using. But some people don't have that starting point. Um, and, and picking this first channel is extremely important because when you only have one channel, you're 100% reliant on that node. It doesn't matter how decentralized the Lightning Network is, if you only have one conduit to it and that node goes offline, you're offline too. So I really appreciate the way that uh, Zap will actually just suggest some nodes up front. Uh, they give you the option to specify your own, but, but they have a pretty friendly you know, set of options that if you connect to any of these, you're, you're probably going to be pretty good off, um, at least initially. 
And uh, likewise, uh, Async's Eclair wallet gives you uh, a really strong option up front to connect to the Async node, which is super well connected. They even offer uh, reciprocal channels, which is, which is very cool. However, I do think that this could be a good learning experience for users to understand why these are good channels. Um, some people might think, oh, if I just open it to my buddy, like that, you know, I'm connected to the network. But teaching people about um, you know, good routing nodes is, is worthwhile for their Lightning experience. Uh, another thing that I don't see a lot of applications doing for onboarding is to get users to consider more than one channel. Maybe over time you'll end up opening multiple channels, but for most wallets, once you open that first channel, it's not going to bug you about it anymore. It's going to say, okay, good, you have a channel, like you can use the network. But we can really mitigate the, uh, the downsides of having to open a channel and get all of the upsides by just doing a few things. So one idea is that that first channel that you open uh, should be a, you know, a good node, and you probably want a, a higher transaction fee to make sure you get that channel quickly. But while that's going on, you can send really low time preference, low uh, transaction cost channel opens to other channels to make sure that you have more connectivity to the network. So that can all be happening in parallel. Um, and we can mitigate the offsets of having split our liquidity by using things like circular rebalancing, where uh, if you're finding that you need to use one node more often and it doesn't have enough liquidity, you can use the other nodes that you've opened to rebalance and, and get more liquidity on that. And with the upcoming improvements that Connor talked about uh, with multipath payments, well, we may have no downsides to having multiple nodes at all. But the upsides are really important because we want the um, not to rely on a single, to have a single point of failure for a node. We want to be able to route around um, and have people route around to us. So what about autopilot? Wasn't autopilot kind of supposed to fix these features? The idea behind autopilot is that you remove the need to decide on nodes because you have some kind of algorithm doing it for you. And I think it's a really great idea. And when autopilot works, it's a fantastic experience. But it doesn't always work well. We don't have historic data of the graph. We have to assess it on the fly when you're a brand new node if you want to maintain privacy. Um, you just kind of have to bootstrap that data yourself. So sometimes autopilot's going to make bad decisions. And its decision making is totally opaque. You as a new user who are trying it out, you have no idea why it picks which node for what reason. And so when that goes wrong, it wastes the user's time. They have to close that channel out, start up a new one. Uh, if maybe that node doesn't stay online as often as it should, um, or it doesn't have liquidity where you actually want it to go. Uh, maybe it's generally connected to the graph, but, but isn't connected to a particular node you want, or you have to go through many hops. Uh, and this is just really frustrating as a new user. Um, and the experience of going back on chain with autopilot can be really jarring. Uh, a, a common message that I see or get where people are trying to um, find out what happened is that they were ready to go back on chain, they closed their channel out, and then their funds vanished. And that's because autopilot is just going to take any Bitcoin it can get its hands on and open a new channel, which is what we want out of it generally. But uh, for people trying to get off and, and go back on chain, that can be a confusing experience. So this is, these are mostly just problems with the current uh, implementations of autopilot. I think it's going to get better. But I would say in the short term, autopilot isn't quite ready for prime time as, as a new user. Uh, you, just, you don't want to be stuck in a situation where it's done something bad for you. Um, so now you've opened your first channel, uh, but you still need to get inbound liquidity. Even when you open as many channels as you want, you still can't receive payments, which is pretty confusing to new users. They assume that they've opened their channel and, and they're done. Um, so you can get some liquidity by doing this if you're willing to spend down those channels. But for most people, they're at some point going to want to receive more money than they put into the system, um, you know, especially if you're like a merchant or something. Um, so in order to actually get this inbound liquidity, you're going to need someone else to open a channel to you, which can kind of be difficult unless uh, you've got some really nice friends who are willing to do that. Uh, if you're just a node on the edge of the network, no one's going to want to open a channel to you. Fortunately, this doesn't have to be a jarring user experience, because with Lightning, you have to generate an invoice to receive payments. And this is a really good time to stop the user and educate them, let them know what's going on here. So for instance, Eclair, if you try to uh, generate an invoice of more capacity than you have, it'll let you know that you can't receive it. Likewise, the Lightning app also does this. However, these aren't actionable. As a new user, I don't know what inbound capacity is. And uh, just because I don't have it doesn't mean I don't, I don't know where to get it. Um, 
So we have some options for this. You could, you could go with a paid or reciprocated channel service. So LN Big, for instance, they'll open a channel to you if you, you uh, open one to them. Uh, they also offer paid channels. Same with the Lightning Power users. We've got uh, Thor from BitRefill. There are many options for doing this, so pointing a user in that direction might be good. But I kind of think that, that we as developers can offer a more all-in-one solution with pushing uh, a balance to a user while opening a channel to them at the same time. This is pretty similar to the idea of a subatomic swap, but the idea is if you were going to open a channel to a user to get, get them some liquidity, you could have them send you an, uh, an out-of-bound payment on-chain first, and then when you open the channel, just push that balance towards them. So at, for an onboarding experience, this is really awesome because we took this graph from before, and we've actually just merged the last two steps by funding an incoming channel. They're opening a channel to us, and we're getting some uh, liquidity uh, on the network that we can send around all in one operation. So I think that this would be the ideal way to start a user out with their very first channel, is to have them get rid of the deposit process and basically have them purchase a channel to you. Uh, so our users now, we've, we've got some inbound liquidity, we've got some outbound liquidity, we're making payments on the network, and even if a user does everything right, failures are going to happen, especially after seeing uh, Christian's graphs. It's, it's, you know, it still happens to people, um, even if you're really well connected. Um, and it's unfortunate that, that I would say the current state of affairs is that we, we uh, aren't really analyzing our errors. We're not doing our best to, to make sense of them. We, typically just turn it into a string and throw it up on the screen and say, ah, sorry, your payment failed. Go, you know, go figure it out. Um, we don't have any context there. But, but nodes have a lot of tools at their disposal to not only uh, analyze these errors, figure out what went wrong, suggest uh, things to users, but we can prevent them in the first place. Um, and one really good technique for this is payment probing. So Christian already kind of covered it, but the idea here is that um, if you if you have a route defined, uh, you can actually just kind of invent a fake payment to send along that route. And because it's onion routed, the nodes along the way don't, they can't verify whether it's a real payment or not. So you can kind of test out, you can do a dry run of a payment. And uh, if you find that there's an error somewhere in there, you know, one of the nodes isn't online, it doesn't get through for some reason, it just hangs indefinitely, you can keep trying out uh, different routes uh, with these payment probes. And once one of them goes through, you can send the real funds along the way. This can be a time, time uh, costing process to just keep probing. So you might not want to do it on every transaction, but if you have one that has a particularly long set of time locks, or it's a new route that you're not familiar with, you haven't sent a payment along the way before, this can save your user a lot of headaches. Um, I've definitely had a lot of people have a lot of money locked up because uh, they tried to write a large payment and it got stuck, and then you know they're just they're they're out of luck for upwards of a week. Um, another thing that we can do in the case where we can't construct a route, so before we had constructed a route and we were trying it out, where we can't construct a route is to to leverage the fact that our node has the entire graph contained within it. Um, we're we're not just like throwing uh, some requests into a void and hoping that we find a route, we actually have the entirety of the graph with our node. So we can actually look at it, look at that node, um, see what's around it, see if maybe some rebalancing could get us a connection to them. Um, if they're a private node, we can look at the routing hints they gave us and see if we can connect to that. But basically, we're not, we're not alone here. We have all the data at our disposal to make better decisions about how to solve problems. So presenting it to a user and having them figure it out just isn't good enough. Um, so now that we're making payments on the network, uh, we're incurring a little bit of fees along the way. And even though fees on Lightning are really low now, and you know they, they, sometimes it's just a Satoshi or two, uh, we can't just leave them behind. But many wallets are doing that. They're not taking fees into consideration, which has been fine so far because payments tend to be really cheap. But as we've heard a lot of people already say, and probably will continue to hear throughout the weekend, uh, the fee market hasn't matured yet. And it's probably going to go up Running a routing node right now just isn't that profitable, so we need to make it worthwhile for people to uh, lock up their liquidity and provide us routing. 
So as we see those fees rise, if they remain a hidden factor of the user experience, people are going to get more and more shock as they make payments and find out, oh, hey, I paid 3%, 5% on that. Um, and even though we want to stay in Lightning as much as possible, we still have to go back on chain every once in a while. Um, and these interactions uh, tend to be the most costly part of setting up a Lightning node. So we want to be sensitive to the idea that people came to Lightning to save money. They don't want to spend a huge amount of money uh, setting it up. And they may not require the immediacy that high fees get us. They're willing to you know, wait a few hours to confirm. So here are some examples. I think uh, it's, it's the Breeze wallet on the left and Blue wallet on the right, where we're going to make a payment, and there's no talk of fees anywhere in there. And it's only after you've made a payment that these fees become apparent. And this can be really tricky, because uh, either you know, legitimately the fees can get higher, or we've also seen a few bugs on the network, or not on the network, but rather people mistakenly setting very high fees uh, who are routing nodes. And if you set up uh, your node, you only have one connection, one path through, you're going to pay that fee, even if it's ludicrously high. So unless you've set limits um, in your code to not automatically spend on, on high fees, and you're not presenting it to the user, you might you know, cause them a lot more pain than they were willing to, uh, to go through. Um, we also see with channel opening and closing, oftentimes people are, are not even giving an option. They're just using a fee estimator. Fortunately, uh, Async Seclair gives you the option when opening a channel, which is really nice. They give you a time estimate of uh, how long your fee is going to take to confirm your channel. But when closing, and this is the case with every wallet I've encountered, uh, there is no option there. However, if you're someone who has a lot of channels and they are of varying degrees of quality, you're going to want to go through and close them out every once in a while. And I don't really care when that money comes through. I don't care when that channel closes. I'm willing to pay the lowest fee possible. And yet, I've paid tens of thousands of Satoshis when fees are high and I go to close a channel. And the estimator just runs wild with it. So it's important to consider that, that this is people's money and we really want to save them as much as possible. Um, and not exactly a fee, but I think one thing that people are often mistaken about and assume is a fee is the reserve balance on channels. So channels have to save a little bit of money um, behind for the, the closing out fee um, of, of broadcasting an on-chain transaction. And that tends to be a decently high amount because we want to make sure that that transaction goes through if we have to like um, recover from a breach. And so if we don't explain that to users, they're just going to assume that money's gone. They're going to assume that it was some hidden fee somewhere in there um, that they missed and that they've lost you know, probably not too much money. But again, we want to give pe we want to instill trust in people and make them know where the fees are in Lightning and where they can avoid them. So the, the last part of the user experience I want to go through is the, the transition back to layer one. Um, the path going back on chain is really tedious and manual right now. You have to go through, uh, pick a channel to close out, close it out, wait for those funds to confirm, then you can send your money. But we should be leveraging this as an opportunity to suggest to a user how they should manage their nodes. So we can score channels based on how much you use them, how, much, uh, how balanced they are, how many channels they're connected to, and suggest to users maybe they want to close out some unwanted channels. And we can figure that out by having them try to send Bitcoin first, and then maybe looking at how much they want to send, seeing which channels are the best to close out. Likewise, they may find that if they're trying to send a small on-chain uh, transaction, that looping out or using some other uh, on-chain atomic swap may be cheaper in the long run, especially if they have very few channels and they're going to be sacrificing a lot of liquidity to close out that channel and have to reopen it, maybe lose their connection to the network. So all these little tidbits and pieces of advice, I think, are, are lost if you don't understand the user that you're building for. And I think something that we take for granted a little bit as Lightning developers is how awesome our users are, because they're inquisitive, they're curious. They came to Lightning because they want to learn, uh, or you know, it somehow like feeds their Bitcoin interest. People aren't coming to Lightning yet to have a better PayPal. Um, and so I really want to empower these curious users and, and bring them to that aha moment. And I think that hiding away all the dirty parts of the Lightning experience or, or trying to smooth it out to a point where they don't even understand what they're doing isn't the right path forward. Because when you can get users to understand Lightning, they get really excited about it. They want to come here. They want to talk about it. They want to learn more, use it more, uh, and they become great evangelists. So I think we, as application developers, should do our best to bring people to this state and not necessarily just try to be better than PayPal. 
So thanks for listening, y'all. Uh, if any of this inspired you or made you want to work on uh, making Lightning Wallets better, most of the ones that I showed here are open source. So I would actively invite everyone to contribute, whether it's just suggesting things in the issue queue or it's actually writing code. Uh, become a part of building a better Lightning experience. Thanks.